Well, hi, everyone. Jake again here with IBPF. And I want to thank you all so much for joining today's webinar on the topic of overcoming self-stigma and bipolar disorder with Dr. Andrea Vasilev. And this is a special one to start the new year, as we hope you walk away with a sense of how valuable you truly are. And there will be a 20-minute question and answer session at the end of this webinar. You may type your questions at any time throughout the presentation. And Dr. Vasilev is a doctor of psychology, a therapist in the state of California, and the creator of the first self-stigma program for bipolar disorder. She is a writer, a speaker, an academic, and a passionate mental health advocate. In everything she does, Dr. Vasilev is someone who lives with bipolar disorder. She has written for outlets such as Slate Magazine and Behavioral Health News and was interviewed as a lived experience expert for the Los Angeles Times. And Dr. Vasilev is deeply committed to the depression, bipolar support alliance, sitting on the advisory board and serving as the education chair for DBSA California. With the academic organization, the International Society for Bipolar Disorders, Dr. Vasilov co-chairs the 2024 Experts by Experience Committee and sits on the task force for psychological interventions in bipolar disorder. And Dr. Vasilov hopes that by telling her own story of life with bipolar disorder through the lenses of clinical causes, treatments, and outcomes that she can provide education, hope, and comfort to others. Thank you, Jake, and thank you everybody for being here. Yes, as Jake said, I am a doctor of psychology. I work as a therapist in California under a clinical psychologist. I created a self-stigma program that we're going to talk about, but I'm gonna skip over the full bio because Jake did it so beautifully for me. Um, this isn't about me and tell you that above all, I've lived with bipolar disorder for 25 years, over 25 years now. And so let's get into things. I'm wondering, why are you here at this talk about shame and self-stigma? Let me ask you some questions. Are you embarrassed about having bipolar disorder? Do you carry a sense of shame about yourself because of your diagnosis? Or do you live with low self-esteem? you might be living with self-stigma and that is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what self-stigma is, what you can do about it, and most importantly, why you are worthy. Now I'm here because I wanna give you some control back over your life instead of letting the ideas of society hold you down. So before we can really talk about self-stigma, let's go back to basics. What is stigma? This is kind of a buzzword these days. It gets thrown around a lot. So stigma is defined as an attribute that is deeply discrediting, okay? We're all different, and we label people, the world, things as different in order to understand a very complex world that we live in. But when you label someone as different in a bad way, that's a stigma. That's an attribute that is deeply discrediting. A difference that spoils someone's identity is a stigma. So stigma is, in fact, inherently negative. You can have positive stereotypes. We'll get to that in a second. But a stigma is a negative thing. It's discrediting. So stigmas form stereotypes. Stereotypes are oversimplified ideas about members of a group. They can be positive. They can be negative. But they're these oversimplified ideas about people in a specific group. We've all heard a lot of stereotypes and a lot of stigmas about a lot of groups of people. But let me walk you through an example, a PC example. So redheads have bad tempers. Now I can, I can use this example because I'm a redhead. So the stigma is the bad temper. That's an attribute that is deeply discrediting to someone who has red hair. The stereotype is this image, this idea of a fiery redhead. Then there's a prejudice, which is a negative attitude you might have towards redheads because of this supposed bad temper, this fiery temper. And then there might even be discrimination where let's say maybe you don't want to be my friend because I have red hair and therefore I, I probably have a bad temper. By the way, it's not true. So you see the problem here with stigmas, with stereotypes. You're not seeing an individual for who they are when you see them through the lens of a stigma. You're making presumptions about them because of a group they belong to, right? This leads to prejudice, to discrimination. So stigma fuels prejudice, which fuels discrimination. And there we have a problem. There are actually other forms of stigma. What we've been talking about is called public stigma because they're beliefs that are held generally by the public, right? 
There's also perceived stigma, which is the stigma that you feel others have towards you. Going to be correlated, going to be related to public stigma, obviously. There's institutionalized stigma or structural stigma, which is when stigma finds its way into public policy, government, healthcare, things like that. And of course, my favorite, self-stigma. It's a bit complicated, all of this stigma talk, definitions, etc. So let's get back to self-stigma specifically in bipolar disorder. So consider those questions I asked you again. Are you embarrassed about having bipolar disorder? Do you carry a sense of shame about yourself because of your diagnosis? Or do you have low self-esteem? This brings us to self-stigma. So what is self-stigma? Drum roll, please. Self-stigma refers to the negative beliefs and attitudes you hold about yourself due to your bipolar disorder. So negative beliefs and attitudes you hold about yourself due to your bipolar disorder. There is a negative value judgment involved here, a negative value judgment of yourself because of your condition. All right, so where does this come from? How does self-stigma form? Well, self-stigma, which is also sometimes called internalized stigma, happens when people internalize public stigmas, the public stigmas we were just hearing about. So we internalize public stigmas that we've heard about a certain group, like people with bipolar disorder. So we hear these stigmas and then we unconsciously apply them to ourselves, like without realizing it, it happens. So for example, there's a public stigma that people with bipolar disorder are dangerous. Have you heard that one? I, I hear this one a lot, more than hear it, I even, I see it. I see it in the media, I see it highlighted in the news. Um, this is a public stigma that's out there. So if you hear this, you witness this over and over again, you're aware of it, eventually you come to agree with it, you come to endorse it somewhat. Then let's say you yourself get a diagnosis of bipolar and because you already believe somewhere and you deep down that people with bipolar disorder are dangerous, you apply the stigma to yourself. You internalize it. You make it true about you. And then you start to feel awful about yourself because chances are you're not dangerous. And we'll talk more about outcomes in a minute. But another example is people with bipolar disorder are weak. That's one you hear as well. So you hear this, you hear this, you hear this. It's like air pollution, even without realizing it, you begin to take it in, you're aware of it, and then you start to endorse it. You start to agree with it. And when you're diagnosed, then you start to apply it to yourself. So you see here, we've gone from public stigma to self-stigma and all the problems that self-stigma can cause. So here are two example, two more example self-stigmatizing thoughts. Consider if you've ever thought these. I am damaged or broken or I am lazy. I'm damaged or broken. I am lazy. These are things we hear about people with bipolar disorder, quote unquote, as a group, and then we apply them to ourselves. So studies have found that you're more likely to experience self-stigma in bipolar disorder if you have generally a more severe course of illness. So things like rapid cycling or a seasonal pattern or more hospitalization. Studies have shown that these might, these correlate to increased amounts of self-stigma. So it seems like the more your condition impacts your actual life, the more you may find yourself in agreement with these self-stigmatizing thoughts. And the more you agree with them, the more you apply them to yourself. There's another problematic way of thinking that I've seen a lot in clients, in the community, and people who have taken my self-stigma program, here's what happens. I see this a lot. Think, think if this resonates. So people have very real, true struggles or experiences because of their bipolar disorder, okay? So something real happens. No one's arguing the reality of this situation. But we distort these experiences into beliefs that are untrue and, and absolutely unhelpful. So for example, I'll give you an example. Let's say 
someone is struggling in the workplace. Maybe they're struggling to meet their job requirements. Maybe they're struggling with their schedule. They're having a struggle in the workplace that is due to their bipolar disorder, okay? That experience in their head might become distorted into something like, I am useless in the workplace. I'm useless in the workplace. That statement is exaggerated. That statement is not true and it is not helpful and it fosters shame and it fosters embarrassment. So true life example, true story. I used to be a teacher. I had to be in the classroom at 7 a.m. every day. It turns out, this is not a thing I could do. It really, it really screwed with my mood. I really, really struggled. And I started to think, oh my gosh, I can't be in the classroom at 7 a.m. I am totally useless in the workplace. Now, was that true? Was that fair? Was that helpful? No, here I am with a different meaningful career. I am not useless in the workplace. And my bet is you are not either. So another example might be if you're struggling to achieve goals, right? Okay, I'm having a struggle. This is a real struggle. I'm really dealing with it. But it becomes distorted in your head as, I will never amount to anything, right? I will never amount to anything. This is distorted. You might be having a struggle. You might even be having a series of struggles. But it's not true that you're never going to amount to anything. That's an extreme statement. So what I'd really encourage you to do is to hold yourself in compassion when you're having real struggles and not to blow them out of proportion and just make yourself feel worse. So here are some other common self-stigmatizing and distorted thoughts. Keep, keep an eye on these, we're going to come back to these later. I am unreliable. I can't handle anything. I am difficult to love. I am a burden and I will never get better. I'm unreliable. I can't handle anything. I'm difficult to love. I am a burden. I will never get better. I bet you if we had the uh, the video on everybody, everybody would be going, oh yeah, that sounds familiar. That sounds like my inner monologue, right? So what's the problem here? What's the problem with these thoughts? Are you feeling bad, right? Why are, why are you here? Chances are, if you're having these thoughts, you might be having low self-esteem, feeling flawed, feeling defective, feeling not good enough. Feeling shame, shame is a big one. We'll talk about that in a minute. Studies have shown that people with self-stigma and bipolar disorder experience a lower quality of life, that they have worse functioning, personal functioning, psychosocial functioning, occupational work functioning, that they have worse depressive symptoms. So pause on that one. It seems that feeling bad about having symptoms can actually give you worse depressive symptoms. Chew on that for a second. People who are experiencing self-stigma are less likely to seek help. Uh, therefore, they often have worse physical and mental health. They might withdraw socially. It's been shown that they have poorer coping skills and they live life with less of a sense of well-being. So some real problems here that come from these thoughts. The people I've seen in my um, in my groups, there's a couple of stories I could tell you. So one lovely young woman she had an episode while she was working at a job and she was so embarrassed about it. She was so embarrassed about having the label of bipolar disorder that instead of telling her employer and saying, hey, I need some time off, I need some support, I need whatever, she quit her job and found a new job. Not just once, but like two or three times. Instead of asking for the help she needed, she had so much stigma and so much shame that she just quit her job and moved on. I've also seen people who hide their diagnosis from families and then they don't get the help that they need. Now I know families are very complicated and maybe your family wouldn't be supportive, but to not share just because you're ashamed is a different story, right? I've also seen people who are so ashamed of their symptoms that they don't ask for help. They don't get professional help. So when they don't get help, they don't get better. They continue to suffer. So we've got this really negative feedback loop spiraling here. So shame, let's talk about shame for a minute, just to clarify. Shame is not the same as guilt. Shame and guilt, not the same, but like cousins maybe, right? Guilt is when you feel bad about something you've done and it helps you learn and change your behavior, right? It's adaptive. It helps you change your behavior, learn from maybe a mistake you made, guilt can actually be helpful. Shame 
involves a value judgment on the core of who you are. It's unpleasant and it's damaging. So think of it this way. Guilt is, I feel bad. Shame is, I am bad. Guilt is, I feel bad. Shame is, I am bad. So you can see where these self-stigmatizing thoughts, these distorted thoughts, could fuel shame very easily. Okay, so enough academic talk. Like, What can we do about shame and self-stigma, right? Having bipolar disorder is hard enough. Like, Do we really need to be making our lives more difficult? So I created the world's first program to address self-stigma specifically in bipolar disorder. It is called Overcoming Self-Stigma in Bipolar Disorder. Uh, it is an eight-week group program that's being run across the world. I actually just got word the other day that it's going to be translated into Japanese for use there. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can sign up to participate in the program for free. I'm hopefully going to be running some studies this year. So I'm collecting for a waiting list to contact people for those studies. So if you go to the website, it's O-S-S-I-B-D. So it's the acronym O S S ibd.com and click on the banner on the top. You can fill out your information and you can be put on the wait list for future studies. And again, it's free. I'm not selling anything. I'm just here to help. So, but what can we do about it now? Like right now, right now, I want you to leave here with a positive perspective for your year ahead. And I want you to begin to realize what a truly valuable and beautiful human you are, that you are not defined by this condition. So I wanna walk you through a few techniques. The first is language. Mind your language. People often say, I am bipolar, instead of, I have bipolar, okay? I am bipolar, I have bipolar, and what's the difference? Most people will default to, I am bipolar. But I ask you, would you say, I am cancer? Would you say, I am broken leg? No, you would not. You would say, heaven forbid, I have cancer. I have a broken leg. This is what we call person first language. It's not you. Bipolar is not you. It's something that you have. And when you talk about it like this, saying I have instead of I am, it takes away some of the power of the condition and focuses on who you are. Now, as a small side note, sometimes people prefer to say I am bipolar for personal reasons. That's fine. I'm not here to tell anybody they're wrong, but it should be done with intention. If you're defaulting to I am bipolar, I would urge you to reconsider because language shapes how we think and how we think shapes how we feel. The second thing I want to share is let's focus on the rest of your identity, specifically your roles and your strengths, okay? So first let's think about the many things that you are in life. Consider the, the whole you, the big picture. What roles do you play in life, right? What else are you other than person with bipolar disorder? Are you a parent, a sibling, a, a musician, an artist, a poet, a programmer, um, a barista? Um, I'm riffing here. <laughs> so a dancer, uh, an actress, um, an influencer, so many things, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, like what, whatever you are. These are the things that help define you. And I think you'll find that they outweigh, quote unquote, person with bipolar disorder. So think about that for a second while I take a drink. So the things that you are in life, the roles that you play, consider those, like make a mental tally. I'd also ask you to think about what personal strengths do you have? Hmm? Are you kind, considerate, compassionate, empathetic, intelligent, witty, funny, inventive, creative? Again, I'm riffing all of these things. Um, and I would ask you, are some of these things maybe even because of bipolar disorder, right? Are you resilient? Are you dedicated? strong, creative, these are all things that might even be due to your experience with bipolar. So third, the third thing we can do like right now, right now, is challenge your thoughts. So if you're feeling shame, you're feeling embarrassment, 
you're feeling less than, examine your thoughts. Are you having a self-stigmatizing thought? Are you at that moment internalizing society's opinions? As we've seen, people do this. We absorb society's opinions, society's public stigma, and we apply it to ourselves, right? Again, people hear this, they apply it to themselves. Is that what's happening? Are you? Is that really your voice in you or is that society's voice in you giving you this self-stigmatizing thought and this unpleasant feeling? Or are you distorting your experiences like we talked about? Are you maybe focusing too much on one bad experience and negating the positive? Or are you overgeneralizing, saying, well, it happened once, it happens all the time. Not the same. If it happened once, doesn't mean it happens all the time. So people view their experiences through a distorted and untrue, unhelpful lens. They have these thoughts and they end up feeling terrible. But you can replace these thoughts with more true, more helpful thoughts. So let's revisit the examples from earlier, the the um, unhelpful, untrue thoughts, and see if we can make them more true and more helpful. So the first one we said was, I am unreliable, okay? How can we reposition that? How can we reframe that so that it's more true and more helpful? I might say, sometimes I am able to keep commitments and sometimes I struggle, but I always try my best. So I am unreliable becomes sometimes I'm able to keep commitments and sometimes I struggle, but I always try my best. See how much better you feel with that thought than with the original thought? Another one, I can't handle anything. I can't handle anything. Oh my gosh, I can't handle anything. How might we turn that one around? We might say, I have overcome many obstacles, in fact, and sometimes I have to work harder than others to regulate my reactions. So I have overcome many obstacles and sometimes I have to work harder than others to regulate my reactions. Way more true, way more helpful. Two more. I am difficult to love. I am difficult to love. That one, that hurts, right? So what if we spin that instead as I have strengths and weaknesses just like anybody else and I am worthy of love the way I am. Maybe we should write this one down. I have strengths and weaknesses just like anyone else and I am worthy of love the way I am. And the last one is I will never get better. I'm, I've done this one. We've all done this one, right? This is like part of the course. I will never get better. Things are always going to be this bad. Let's reframe that one. I may have long-term struggles, but things are always changing. I don't know the future, right? I may have long-term struggles, but things are always changing. I don't know the future. So again, if you are feeling bad, see if you've got a self-stigmatizing or a distorted thought. If you can change the thought, you can change the feeling. The last technique I wanna share with you is to remember that feelings are not facts. Feelings are not facts. If you're feeling ashamed, if you're feeling less than, that doesn't make these things true. Just because you feel something doesn't make it true. So try to differentiate between emotions and reality. If you're feeling less than, you're feeling broken, you're feeling defective, that's not necessarily reality. It's a feeling. Reality is one thing. Your reaction to reality is what causes your emotions. So this is kind of a brief overview of some of the things that we cover in the program. If you'd like to delve deeper into addressing self-stigma, I encourage you, visit ossibd.com, click the banner, and add your name to the list. So in the program, we, we cover other things as well. So we talk about specific psychoeducation on bipolar, including myths, myth-busting about bipolar disorder, and also considering what recovery is. Like, what does recovery mean for you? Recovery is, it's a journey. I'll give you, give you a sneak peek. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It's ongoing. It's back and forth. It's not a place you get and then you stay forever. That's not generally how it works. Uh, the program also covers what we call narrative enhancement and cognitive therapy, where we talk about how to tell our life story, what to focus on, what matters to us, the picture we want to paint for ourselves, how we want to tell our story. Of course, we learn more about stigma and self-stigma, and we use some cognitive behavioral therapy skills like this thought reframing. We also talk about disclosure, which means 
telling people about your condition. So we talk about who do you want to tell? When do you want to tell them? How do you want to tell them? Do you want to tell them at all? We go through all of that. Disclosure is, is a really big topic um, because it's something we're faced with every day. And you don't you don't owe anyone an explanation. You deserve to remain in control of your information and your story. And we also talk about friends, family, and culture, how all of these relationships impact self-stigma. There's really interesting data about self-stigma across cultures, about stigma in family, stigma by association, how to talk about that in friendships and romantic relationships. There's a lot to talk about. So a word about battling stigma itself, public stigma. Remember, we, we started with public stigma, and that's public stigma fuels self-stigma. So if we can fight public stigma, we can fight self-stigma on a more systemic level. Now, I will say it is certainly not the responsibility of any one individual to fix all of the stigma that is out there. It's honestly, it's not even your responsibility to do anything. But if you're here, you might be interested. If battling public stigma is going to be detrimental to you or your well-being or your moods or your health, don't do it. But if you want to be a stigma warrior, think about the following. Some ways to battle public stigma. One, education and awareness. That means both educating yourself and educating others. So if you educate yourself, this means you won't implicitly or unintentionally perpetuate stigmas. If you know good information, you can spread good information. And educating others, that can look like correcting wrong assumptions, pointing out misinformation, not in a combative or aggressive way, but if you know right information, you can share right information and pick out information that is harmful and damaging and incorrect. Now, educating others, this can be done formally or informally. It might be, you know, running a a workshop in your, your teenage daughter's health class about mental health, right? That's formal. Or informally with the people you know, your colleagues, your friends, even strangers that the opportunity presents itself and you feel comfortable. You can challenge stereotypes. Again, you can challenge stereotypes with people you know with respect and, and gentleness, um, but being assertive and saying what you know to be true. Once I actually wrote to a very popular TV show because I didn't like how one of their characters was portrayed <laughs> and I felt the need to say something. And that might be that might be a very small thing. I'm sure that was a drop in the bucket. I don't even know if anybody read the letter, but it's part of a movement. You can be part of this bigger movement that over time will shift the narrative, shift the stigmas and shift the stereotypes. One way to educate is to tell your story. Again, to the extent that you're comfortable and in the situations and contexts that you are comfortable with. So you can be an example of what bipolar disorder really is. If you're comfortable, you can be open about your diagnosis so people can learn the truth of how this, this condition presents, how it operates, how it plays out. Again, you can do this formally or informally. Formally might be in the form of blogs or social media, something like that, writing, talking, sharing, but it can also be just as effective informally, talking to your friends, talking to your colleagues, telling your story, then you become their idea of how bipolar disorder works as opposed to a stigmatized idea, a stereotype, something like that. Um, again, a note on telling your story about disclosure, it can be difficult. And it should be considered carefully, you know, thinking who would be a safe person to talk to? What are the pros and cons of telling this person? How can I tell my story and remain in control and still get my point across? We talk about this a lot in the program because it's, it's really important to consider. You can also help other people tell their story. So you can listen to other people. You can support peer advocates. You can support the community when they share. You can share successful stories of those living with bipolar disorder. I have a friend who's making a documentary, Brainstorm the Film, um, and she's telling stories. She has bipolar and she's telling stories of other people who have bipolar. She's lifting people up to smash this stigma. You can also engage with your community. You can organize or support programs for mental health education, whether it's 
in government legislation or supporting it in schools or law enforcement, right? You can participate in events such as suicide prevention walks. Everything you do, someone else sees and it impacts how they think about bipolar disorder. So in battling public stigma in these ways, you can ultimately reduce it. You can be part of this bigger movement and thereby you can reduce how much self-stigma other people suffer from. The less public stigma there is, the less self-stigma there will be, the less shame and suffering. So in conclusion, I am I am not here to play Pollyanna and tell you like, hey, it's great to have bipolar disorder. The struggle is real. Please don't misunderstand me. It has ruined parts of my life. I imagine it has ruined parts of yours too, maybe. But, but. I know a lot of people with bipolar disorder, friends, colleagues, clients, some celebrities. And I am endlessly, like continually amazed by who we are as a people, as a group. I have seen extraordinary empathy, depth of feeling, resilience, fortitude, courage, creativity. If you are living with this condition, please, I beg you, take a moment and be proud of yourself. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of everything you've overcome. Be proud of how far you've come. And just remember that you are so much more than this diagnosis. You are truly a beautiful human. And I thank you for being here. Dr. Vasilev, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I'm sure so many of our audience members will find this valuable and even go on to look more into your study. And so I want to let everyone know this will be the portion of the presentation where we, we will be doing a question and answer session. So please drop your questions into the question box and we will try to get to as many as we can. And Dr. Vasilov, the first question comes from an audience member who has lived with bipolar disorder for many years and wants to write a book detailing their lived experience, but they're having a challenging time overcoming the fear of sharing that they have a bipolar disorder diagnosis. Is there any recommendations that you may have to get over their fear? I so admire this. I think it's wonderful. Again, this is telling your story. This is educating people. I think it's important to acknowledge, I'll be totally real, haters gonna hate, right? <laughs> there are always gonna be people out there who don't understand. And that's really how I look at it. If people are giving you pushback, they're giving you nastiness, they're uneducated, they're ignorant. So I think you have to accept that there may be some of that, but think about what you'll gain and think about what your memoir will offer to other people. There are so many amazing memoirs out there and they've brought so much to the world. They educate, right? They bring that knowledge to the people and they bring down that stigma. So I, I really hope that you do this. You might get some pushback, but I think the benefits will probably far outweigh the negatives. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Thank you. And so our next question more revolves around bipolar disorder in general. Our audience member wants to know what a difference between bipolar disorder type one and bipolar disorder type two is. Interesting. Okay. So I'd encourage you, first of all, to remember that diagnoses are really just codes that treatment providers use to make their lives easier, right? If person A comes in with symptoms one, two, and three, and they already had another person who had symptoms one, two, and three, they'll know how to treat that person, right? They won't have to reinvent the wheel each time. So I encourage you, don't get too hung up on diagnoses, on codes and types and all that. But the difference is the presence of mania. For bipolar one, you have to have one full manic episode, which is um, seven days or more, unless it ends in hospitalization. Whereas in bipolar two, you have to have a hypomanic episode, which is only four to seven days, and a full depressive episode. There's also there's also a whole other part of bipolar disorder that is people pay much less attention to, the bipolar spectrum, where maybe you don't meet these requirements for one or two because they are pretty rigid, right? Actually, most people exist on this spectrum. Most people experience depression more than anything else. There's a whole spectrum of bipolar disorders. If you're interested in bipolar spectrum disorders, check out Psych Education, Oh my gosh, is it .org or .com? I don't know, sorry. Um, but that's the main difference between one and two is the presence of mania. You actually don't have to experience depression to have bipolar one, just mania. A great answer. And then 
If anyone's curious about the psych education, it will be psycheducation.org. Thank you. And of course, trust me, I didn't know off the top of my head either. I did a quick search, but that's a great resource. And so our next question is for your OSS IBD program, is it self-paced or live? Ah, great question. It is live over video conferencing. It's a group program and I lead it. That's great. And then so our next question is, where do you recommend that someone can read more about real life experiences? Ooh, now we're going to go through the list of memoirs, huh? <laughs> so first of all, as, um, as we'll say at the end, I run an educational Instagram account. A lot of people share their stories on Instagram and that's very cool, but there are some wonderful books. Um, you can look up Terry Cheney. She's, she is bipolar one. She's um, written a number of memoirs. I think her main one is called Manic. Sarah Schley wrote about her experience on the bipolar spectrum. It's called Brainstorm. That's the name of the film. Um, there's a number, General Greg Martin wrote Bipolar General. Um, there are so many wonderful memoirs. If you go to Amazon and you start poking around there, there are some really great stories. Also, there are blog posts, right? IBPF runs a wonderful blog, an absolutely wonderful blog where people regularly tell their stories. Mm. Yes, there are many valuable resources out there. And so our next question is, one of our audience members wants to know when you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder because they were just diagnosed themselves and are feeling a little bit lost in the process and want to know what words you would have to tell them. Well, my heart goes out to you. I think the words I would tell you might depend on how old you are. So I'll tell you, I was diagnosed at 14. Now you know how old I am. Um, and I can understand if you're older when you're diagnosed, I can understand how that could be kind of really disorienting because you've had one idea your whole life. And then all of a sudden someone tells you, you have this diagnosis that comes with all of these stigmas and all of these ideas around it. Right. So my advice to you would be to remember the only thing that's changed is what's written in your record. What's in your medical chart. The only thing that's changed is that someone's stuck a label on you, ideally for the purposes of getting you better treatment and better help. You haven't changed. Who you are hasn't changed. What you love hasn't changed. How you treat other humans hasn't changed. What matters to you hasn't changed. Like nothing else has changed. You are still the same person. That's great. Our next question wants to know if there is anything being done in the field of medical education with other professionals about reducing stigma in bipolar disorder so that people in the medical field are aware of this. Right. And there is actually a lot of stigma. I work in the medical field and there is, I get pushback, I get stigma. So that's a great question. Maybe that's a project for my next lifetime. Um, but in terms of educating medical providers, I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that these types of stories, these open stories where people tell their stories of their lives, that practitioners, doctors, they they see those differently than they see their own clients and patients, right? Their client, the patient, the primary responsibility there is to keep you safe, get you well, right? When they read someone else's experience, it's more casual, it's less formal, they don't have a responsibility. So I think a great way to educate um, doctors is to have them read these lived experiences, to have them come in contact with people with lived experiences and get a fuller view than just seeing a client or a patient for their symptoms and trying to like put out fires and resolve their symptoms. Hmm. So our next question is one of our audience members is feeling that his coworkers may perceive him as unintelligent because since his diagnosis, he has had some cognitive challenges with remembering stuff and so forth. What would you say to this person who wants to feel their true value. I'm sorry that's happening. That is tough. I've seen that before. That's a big struggle. But I'd ask you, it sounds like intelligence and the ability to remember things is a value of yours. But I'd ask you two things. Is it the only thing that makes you valuable? Your ability to remember things? Do you bring other things to the workplace like dedication and a, being a good team player? I mean, there's tons of things you could bring to the workplace. Is this is this the only thing you bring to the workplace or do you have 
other things to offer. And it also reminds you that there is more than one type of intelligence, everything from emotional intelligence to artistic intelligence, kinesthetic intelligence, right? There's more than one kind of intelligence. So I think in this case, it's important to compartmentalize this because this is just this is just one thing. It's one in a list of things. It's one of a whole sort of mural of things that makes you who you are. Hmm. And then our next question is, do you have any thoughts on dealing with, in quote, fake supporters? And by fake supporters, they mean people who support them one-on-one, -on -one, but while around other people or in public, they are more hush about the subject and don't have your back publicly. Ouch, that's got to be really hurtful. My goodness, I'm sorry that's happening. I would wonder what what's going through that person's head? Like, what's their insecurity that they're so insecure that they can't even admit to supporting you in your own mental health condition, right? This is so clearly not about you. This is so clearly about them. So you've got to decide, is, is this person worth having around? Does this person care about me? You could even, you know, not in the moment, maybe at a later, calmer, you know, more general time, ask them, like, what's up? You know, use your I feel statements. I feel really supported when we talk about this. I'm so grateful for your friendship and your support. I feel hurt or I feel unheard when we're in public and you won't acknowledge A, B, C, or D, whatever it is. So you could you could have a gentle conversation with them, not an accusatory one, but one where you express how you feel. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to individuals who do not feel like they can share their mental health diagnosis fully with their doctor or treatment team. Interesting. So I would imagine that a treatment team or a doctor would have a full sense of the diagnosis. Maybe this person means they can't share um, sort of all of the aspects, all of the experiences they're having. I'm going to guess that's what this person means. So going um, into a little more in depth, I'm sorry for interrupting go ahead, you. Go ahead but they don't want to be viewed as a perceived danger or be forced to anything involuntarily. So that's why it seems that they are struggling to express what they're experiencing to their doctor. I get that. I get that a lot. And some doctors do make a climate of kind of confrontation and fear. I, as a clinician, encourage other clinicians to make, I'm presuming we're talking about self-harm and suicide. I encourage doctors to be able to talk about that. You really want to have a provider who you can talk to, who you can feel safe talking to, because ultimately they want to get you the help you need, right? So I would encourage you to see, can you maybe tell them a little, like a little bit at a time and gauge how they react, right? Also, if you're not comfortable with one member of your treatment team, maybe you're comfortable with another member, right? If you're not comfortable with your psychiatrist, maybe you're more comfortable with your therapist, right? Maybe you can ask them for resources, but I'd encourage you to, to see if you can chip away at that a little because ultimately people want to take care of you. That's what really matters. Hmm. And our next question is, what words of encouragement do you have for someone who just recently came out of an episode? Hmm. Well, if you were in the episode, I would say this too shall pass, right? If it was a depressive episode, I have a quote hanging in my house that says, the bottom of the valley never provides the clearest view. But if you just came out of the episode, is there more context as to what they're dealing with? No, there is not. So if it was an up episode, you might be dealing with the ramifications of some decisions you made. And I think then what's really helpful is a bit of humbleness, a bit of humility, and the ability to say, I'm sorry, not that this was your fault, but to try and make amends for anything that might have gone wrong, if you've hurt some feelings or burnt some bridges. If it's a depressive episode, I'd say, phew, that's a relief. But most of all, I'd remember you just ended an episode. That's proof that this is cyclical and nothing lasts forever. Mm -hmm. And then for our next question, one of our audience members, they deal with a physical disability as well as bipolar disorder and they're curious what to do about stigma if they tell their doctor that they live with bipolar disorder as well hmm. boy doctors are really failing us today aren't they right <laughs> not all doctors but i'm sorry you guys have come up with these come up against these challenges um that's a double stigma and that's very hard but again remember this person is there to help you they want what is best for you. So 
ask yourself, are you worried about what they will think? Or are you worried about how you will feel if you tell them? Will you feel less than? Is it you internalizing society's beliefs? Or are you actually afraid this doctor is going to be like, oh my gosh, you have bipolar? Like, I can't treat you anymore, right? Like, where where is that fear actually? Is it internal or is it external? And then one of our audience members is in exams for their university. And recently they've been in a depressive episode and haven't been able to read or do any studying. Is there anything that this person can do? Yes, I would say if you are at the point where we've all been there, where you you can't process cognitively, you can't, you just can't, right? Fill in the blank. I would see if you can get accommodations. Now, accommodations are due to you as part of the, if you're in America, the American with Disabilities Act. Um, they can be very tricky to get, but I encourage you to try, whether it's informally talking to your professors or talking to the head of your program about what's going on and maybe asking for an extension um, or formally through the, there'll be a disability services office or an office of accommodations where you can go and you can ask for help. You'll need your doctor to support this, to write some letters, fill out some forms. Most importantly though, I'd focus on getting better, right? In the end, you can retake the classes if you absolutely need to, but what matters ultimately is your health so you can get out of this episode. Mm -hmm. And then our next question is, what is the strategy that someone can implement right away when they are dealing with depressive thoughts or self-stigmatizing thoughts? How can they shift their thinking immediately? Right. So I love that. What you want, first of all, identify the thought. Identify that this is a thought, that this is a distorted thought. This is a self-stigmatizing thought. It's not necessarily reflective of reality. And you want to shift that thought to make it two things, more true and more helpful. How you think breeds how you feel. So if you can make your thoughts more true and more helpful in any given instance, be a friend to yourself, right? What would you say to a friend? Would you tell a friend that that thought isn't true and helpful? Would you help them reframe it? Make your thoughts more true and more helpful. Mm -hmm. And then our next question is, is there anything that you considered when sharing your diagnosis in the work field? Or was this something that you were always very open about? Interesting. So it's something I was always very open about. I think because when I was diagnosed at 14, I didn't, I was, I was a young 14. I was still a girl. Um, I didn't really have any concept of what bipolar disorder was. So someone said it to me and I was like, okay, like whatever. <laughs> it didn't, it had no meaning. I had no context. I had not taken in any public stigma yet that I could apply to myself. So I've always been very open. Recently, I've had to be a little more discreet. Um, because I work with clients and while that's very useful to work with clients and they really know that I know what they're going through, um, I don't want them to fear for my well-being or anything like that. So I'm, I'm more deliberate about how I disclose. My purpose is to help here. Hmm. That's great. So that's going to be the last question of the day to day. And right now in the chat, I'm going to drop the link to Dr. Vasilov's website as well as her Instagram so you can keep up with her there. And reach out to her if you would and like. The program. Her. Yes, and I will be adding OSS IBD into the chat. And I just want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, it truly was a special presentation. And without Dr. Vasilov's generosity in speaking for us, none of this would be possible. So I want to thank you very much and ask you if you have any closing comments. I want to thank you, thank IBPF for everything they do. Um, it's an amazing organization. Um, I want you to take this thought away. Remember that you are so much more than your diagnosis. Like write it on a sticky, write it on your hand. Keep telling yourself, remember the thoughts you have, read how you feel. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in attendance. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.